Aren't you thankful that in a world that's full of change and full of chaos that we serve a living God who is unchanging? He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever, and He is well able to do anything He needs to do in your life. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke chapter 24. We'll get going. Won't waste much time getting started this morning. Glad you're here in the house of the Lord with us this morning. Look at your neighbor. Say, neighbor. neighbor. I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Luke chapter 24. I'm going to begin reading in verse 44. We're going to start a new little series here for about the next month talking about the promise of the Father, talking about what the Lord offers us, a lot of things, but we're going to focus on one. Luke 24, verse 44 through 49. It says this. Wow, that helps. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written... About me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Pray with me. Father, we love you. We thank you that your promises are true, God. We thank you, Father, that, that you give us revelation. You open up our minds just like Jesus did for them, and I simply ask by your Holy Spirit that you would open up our minds, that you would let us see you high and lifted up in our life, that you would draw us in, that you would touch us, that you would change us. We love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. So uh, we're at a point here today where, where Jesus has been resurrected. He's, he's with his disciples. He's with the gang, and he, he, their, their minds are blown away, okay? They, they can't fathom this. That, that this has actually happened, that he's there and he, he's talking to them, but they're struggling to believe what they're, seeing, what they're seeing. They're struggling to believe the things he's telling them. And it kind of reminds me of some of us when we get saved and we mature a little bit or we grow a little bit in the Lord, but, but then we still have these moments of like, I struggle with this. I struggle. Do you ever have any moments where you struggle with, just, am I really saved, God? Did you really save me? Or we struggle with, am I really forgiven? I mean, we're still wallowing around this old stuff. It's like, am I really different? Am I really new? Am I really called? Am I really, whatever it is, we, we, we often struggle. And Jesus simply begins telling them, as, he, as we read in verse 44, he says, all the things written about me, they had to be fulfilled. God had to fulfill everything that had been told about me through the scriptures, through the prophets, through the Psalms, through everything led up to me. It all had to be fulfilled. And in verse 45, this is crucial for all of us to really see God. It says that Jesus opened up their minds. He revealed things to them, not necessarily new things, but he opened up and let them see and understand things, many things that they already knew. They already knew what was going to happen, but they didn't understand. He gave them understanding. You and I are changed by the word of God when he begins to give us understanding. We don't just know what the word says, but now it's revealed to us and he lets us see it in a different way. In verse 46, he goes on and said, it's been written that Christ would suffer. I told you these things were going to happen, and but yet on the third day, he would rise again. And he says this, then repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed to the world. Because when you come to me, you turn from your ways, you turn from your old lifestyles, and you come to me in repentance. He says, I'm going to forgive all your sins. I'm going to wipe away the past, and this is what I want you to go and share with the world. In verse 48, this is key as well. He says, you, somebody say, that's me. Say, that's me. That's me. You are witnesses 
In other words, you are supposed to live and share and proclaim this is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came, he died and was buried and rose again so that we would be forgiven, so that we would be right with God. We are all called to be witnesses to this. So last week, we took just a moment to look back, to look back, to look forward, yet to be present. Yet to be where we are in pre- preparation and deal with the things that we need to deal with. One of the things that we, di- we discussed last week was about a promise from God. The old, they, they had the promise that we talked about they're going into this new land. We, uh, th- about having a promise of God for us personally to stand on, to focus on, to help motivate me to keep going the right direction and to stay on track and not get so scatterbrained going in every direction. In other words, a word from God about yourself and about your life that you can stand on. Just this week, just talking to different people in passing, but several just examples of words that different ones felt like the Lord had given them. One of them was this that I've heard from multiple people, but it's, it kind of relates to John 3.30 when it says, He must become greater and I must become less. Can I tell you, that is a word not just for a, a day or two or a year, but that's a word for our life. That in every moment of every day, of every season, that I'm making sure that He is becoming greater and I am becoming less. If you want Jesus to be greater in your life, then check this out. He must become greater and I must become less. This is a lifelong thing. Until Jesus comes again or you become identical to Jesus, we're always going to have to be working on this one. Another one that that different people told me is 2 Corinthians 5.17. You are a new creation. Behold, all things are new. The old is gone and the new has come. This is something that I can stand on when life gets tough, when work gets tough, when family gets difficult. I'm not going to handle it like I used to because behold I am a new creation this is a word from God Romans 8 28 a word for my life because God causes all things to work together for good because we know like Kirk said this morning that life happens and sometimes it's difficult and sometimes it's not the way I thought but at the end of the day I know God is able to cause everything in my life to work for his glory for my good and so I hang on to that that's a word that's given me hope in my life that's my life scripture and moments when I doubt and moments when I'm not sure and moments when I don't understand. But God, I know you're able to make all of this work together for good. We can stand on that. There's many words that we can stand on. God never leaves us. For many of us that feel lonely, he never forsakes us. For some of us that feel dirty, we can be reminded that I, the promise of being forgiven of God's grace and his mercy. How about this one? God supplies all of your needs according to his riches and glory. Quit trying to figure it out your own self and start worshiping God making him greater and watch him supply all of your needs. How about the promise of eternal life? That's something that we can stand on. We hope on. We keep hanging on to when the world's coming against us. Love, joy, peace. He wants to give us joy. Give us peace. For some of us who are anxious and anxiety and we're a bunch of old uh, sour whatever. Yeah. Love, joy, and peace. God gives those things to us. These are all promises, examples of promises that God gives us. Abraham had a promise from God. Do you know what Abraham did with this promise? He passed it on to his kids. He gave it to his children. They passed it on to the next generation and so on and so forth. Moses had a promise. This is what I'm going to do with you, Moses. This is what I'm calling you for. This is what I have for you. You know what Moses did? Moses passed it on to Joshua. Joshua passed it on to the people. We all have promises. David, mighty man of God, David, after God's own heart, he had a promise to David about what he was going to do with his life and what he was going to do with his family. What did David do? He passed it on to his son Solomon. He passed it on for generations to come. There are many promises. And and we begin to find out all the promises of God are true. And they may be a little bit different. But all the promises in the Old Testament, what they begin to do was point everything towards Jesus. It began to get a little more focused when you get to the the, the rest of the, the old prophets. Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Starting with Isaiah, it all begins to point to, towards Jesus. Even going through the minor prophets like Micah, Haggai, and Malachi. And it was all brought to life in Mary. The promise that God gave Mary when he said, hey, you're going to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. This child, this, Mas- this Savior, this Messiah. I just want you to see that there are many promises of God. Can you say thank you, Lord? 
But what I want to ask you today is, what is the promise? What is the promise that God gives us in the New Testament after we become children of God? I'm talking about the one. You know, like you got the one woman. You got the one vehicle. You got the one job. You got the one place you want to live. The one. Well, we read today in Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus says, Behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But now stay in the city. Stay where you're at until you are clothed from power from on high or you receive this promise. So I want to just, I want this to be very, very simple and basic so that we all have a grasp and understanding. Because this kind of stuff gets so twisted in the church and we either make it into a train wreck or we're scared to death of it. But there's a shift. You see, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve were here, they had intimacy with God. Adam was a son of God. Now, when sin came in, it brought separation from God. It brought separation from the Father. And we lost that intimacy until Jesus came back again. And what he did was he restored sons to the Father. He didn't just forgive us of sins. He did that. But really what he was doing was restoring us into right relationship with our Father in heaven. You see, the promise of the Father really ultimately is this. It's sonship. It's not about a gift. It's not about anything special. It's sonship. It's so that you and I, no matter what we've been through in this life, can understand that we're children of God. We have, by the Holy Spirit, the Father's DNA in us. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. The same Spirit that came upon David, that came all upon all the great mighty men and women of God. He's given it to you and I. Now here's the thing. We talk a lot in the church. We hear a lot about the Holy Spirit, about the anointing, about the Holy Ghost, about the Spirit of God, about the presence, about Pentecost. But really, what is it? Who is the Holy Spirit? Now, some of you have many answers, but what does He do? What does He mean to you? I'm not looking for, we don't need another good answer. What does it mean to us? How is it relevant to us? We first need to understand the Trinity. To begin to understand a little bit the Holy Spirit, we must have a little bit of understanding of the nature of God. You see, God is a triune God. That means there's three parts to God. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. The word Trinity, if you concord it or look it up, it's not in the Bible. It's not in Scripture. But all of Scripture points to the fact that God is Trinity. A few examples. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus be upon you, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Again, three. 1 Peter 1, 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, obey Jesus Christ, be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest, in the fullest measure. Listen to me. We understand, and different ones of us take on different pieces of God. But the fullness of God is kind of like a triangle. You see, a triangle has three points. And a triangle has three sides. Unless all three come together, we don't have a triangle. We have kind of a triangle. Or we have an L. Or we have some kind of funky line. So it's the same with God. We cannot have the fullness of God in our church services, in our midst, in our lives, if we don't begin to have all three. See, many of us say this. I believe in God and I trust in Jesus. But that Holy Spirit stuff, I'm leaving alone. I'm not going to mess with that stuff. And the reason is, is because that stuff will mess with us, <laughs> by the way. But here's the point. When we have this attitude about I'm going to pick and choose, and I'm going to take the pieces that I like, we are being robbed or never becoming all that God has for us. We need all three parts. Somebody say, I need all three. Remember verse 48. We read, it says, because you have repented and you've been forgiven, you are now to be a witness for God. 
We're all called to be witnesses of God. We have this mindset in our culture of this is my deal. And me and God's going to do our thing. You have been lied to from the pit of hell because God saved you through his son, Jesus Christ, poured out his blood and everything he had, not just for you, but so then you could turn and be a witness for him. See, we're robbing God when we have these kind of partial mindsets. See, number one is this. God the Father appointed us. Before the beginning of time, he knew the plans that he had for us. Number two, we couldn't do it. We couldn't step into it. Jesus came and he forgave us and he qualified us to walk in the things God has for us. Number three is this. The Holy Spirit is the thing that empowers us to do the things that God's calling us to do. You see, we are witnesses, not just so that we can put on a show at church, not just for works, not just so that we can be heard as somebody better, but we are to be a witness by the way we live our daily lives. Many, many, many people miss it because we think we're being a witness by showing up at church, saying a prayer every once in a while, and then leaving and living our lives however we want to live it. Our biggest witness is not according to whether we do or don't go to church and what we wear when we show up. Our biggest witness, our most powerful message is how do we live our daily lives? So therefore, we have to have the Holy Spirit that dwells with us daily. Many of you know this stuff, but here's the thing you have to understand. Where is God the Father? We want to talk about God. God the Father is on the throne. Psalms 103, verse 19, it says, The Lord has established His throne in the heavens, and His sovereignty rules over everything. His place is on the throne in heaven. Where's the son? Where is Jesus? He's sitting at the right hand of the father. Mark 16, 19. When the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up to heaven and he sat down at the right hand of God. Where's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the part of God. It's the part that dwells with us, that he's given us to walk with us, to live with us. John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another. He will give you the helper. He will send the Holy Spirit who will be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. He's with you now, but he will be in you. After I go away. That's why he said in John 16, 7, that's why it's so important that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the spirit of God, the spirit of truth, the counselor, the comforter, the helper, then he won't come. But when I go, he will send him. The promise is the Holy Spirit. Somebody say the Holy Spirit. Why do I need him? Why do I need the Holy Spirit? There's lots of reasons. You could have seminars for a year on this. But this is what I want to say as a cut line statement. Why do I need him? Because what God wants to do in you and through you, you cannot do on your own. You can't do it. You can't do it. I've tried it. Some of you are trying it right now. It's not going to work. What God wants to do in us and through us, like it says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and 10, when he says, The things that I have prepared for you, eyes not seen, ears not heard, neither has entered into the hearts of man the things that I have for you. But it's being revealed and showing you by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is what's going to help us do the things that God really wants us to do. See, a lot of times we think, well, that stuff is just for pastors and preachers and evangelists. No, no. The Holy Spirit is a gift for moms and dads. It's for teachers. It's for people that are in their workplace. It's for all servants of God. It's for our kids. It's for everyone who is a child of God. So what does the Holy Spirit do? It does a lot of things. It empowers us. It guides us. It teaches us. It convicts us, man. The Holy Spirit, I question people that say, hey, I'm operating in the gift of the Holy Spirit, but yet they're never convicted by God. The Holy Spirit convicts your butt, man. He will make you get on your face and say, you know what? I got a long ways to go. Let me work on this. It puts hope in us. It gives us peace. It helps us love people. It puts us in tune with the Father's voice so that we can know what he's asking us to do. We might say this. Is the promise really for me? I'm not a preacher. And really, I'm not that right. I'm kind of messed up. I've done so much wrong in my life. I don't have a ministry. Acts 2, 38 and 39. 
Peter said this to them. He said, repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as will come to the Lord that he calls to himself. You see, I want you to just see this, that this is a promise from our Heavenly Father. He wants us to have this gift. He wants us to have his presence so that we don't have to question everything. And so that we have some strength that's greater than my strength. When I talk about leaning not on my own strength, but trusting the Lord with everything I have. Man, this is the Holy Spirit within us, empowering us, equipping us like it says in Acts 1.8 that we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Empowering us to live for him. Will we try to understand it? Will we embrace it? Will we ask God to send it? Will we receive it? Be filled with God's Spirit. Be baptized with it even. Because when we are, it's a game changer. It changes the way I view people. It changes the way I look at myself. It gives me strength to look at myself honestly in the mirror of God and look at the things which I already know that I need to deal with. But when the Holy Spirit comes and begins to lead me into all truth, it will equip me. It will make me be a better husband. It will make me be a better dad. It will make me be a better friend. It will make me be a better servant of God. It will empower me to be a disciple of God, not in my own strength, but simply Him doing it through me. You see, we are called not to just believe. Not to just come to church, but we are called to follow Christ. We are called to follow the Lord and then produce fruit for God. And the reality is we can do neither without the help of the Holy Spirit. Without Him instructing us, without Him guiding us, without Him nurturing us and speaking to us. And so here's the challenge. This is very basic, very simple today. But here's what I... I want to challenge us with. Would we be willing to go on a journey? A journey of our heart, our mind, and our spirit over the next month, preparing ourselves to receive in a fuller, fuller way the presence of God in our lives. However God wants to do it where we're at in our life right now. But simply asking Him. Like it says in verse 49, would we stay in this city? Would we stay in this place and begin looking for what God has for us, the promise that he has for us, that would be clothed with his power, would be willing to seek him in preparation. We can prepare our hearts, our minds. We can prepare ourselves through three ways, simply. Number one is prayer. Would we begin asking God to speak to us? Would we be asking God to, to give us knowledge of his Holy Spirit and what it means for our life? For him to send that into our life in a more full way? Would we prepare through fasting? Nobody wants to talk about fasting in the church anymore. But would we begin fasting like when Joshua was about to lead him into the promised land? He said, now go and consecrate yourself. Fast and begin to prepare yourself to receive tomorrow what God wants to do for you. Would you and I be willing to go into some sort of little bit of a fast just asking God, listen, God, there's nothing more important than receiving what you have for me, that I would become less and you would become greater. I don't want to put anything in front of you, God. And then through the scripture, through the word of God, God, speak to me. God, teach me about your Holy Spirit. What do you want me to understand about it? And then what if we all begin preparing and we all begin seeking the Lord over the next month? And then we ask God towards the end of it to come in a real way and begin to fill our lives and fill our hearts and fill our minds with his presence. That it would take over and wipe away some of the other junk and garbage that we deal with. What if we all, just think about it, what if we all, everyone in this place today, in a month, we all became a little bit fuller of the presence of God? What if just a handful of us can't begin to get a little bit fuller of the presence of God and what he wants to do for us? You see, this sounds a little bit familiar to me. 
Because this is the story of Pentecost. After Jesus had ascended and he had gone away. And in Acts chapter 1, it says that about 120 of them. It says that they begin to meet in an upper room for a, for a series of days. And they all went in there and they begin to pray. It wasn't different prayers and it wasn't different wants or different desires. But it says that their voices were as if one accord. In other words, they all just came together and they said, It's not about me, but it's about you and it's about you and it's about all of us because we're worshiping the one that is really about it's all about God and they just begin to seek him because Jesus had said wait until the the father gives you the gift the gift which he's promised and they all came in this place and they begin to seek God and they begin to get together of one accord and then it says in Acts chapter 2 when the day had fully come that God poured out his Holy Spirit and it came in a spectacular way and tongues if it as if fire was on each person they begin to speak out in a heavenly language and they begin to prophesy the things of God and shortly after that the church was birthed and it changed the world radically can I tell you that if you and I would begin to allow God and seek him and ask him to become more full in our life not only will it radically change your life but it'll change your family's life it'll change your church's life it will change this community I'm telling you when the spirit of God comes in our lives it changes everything the question is is there anybody anymore that really wants the Spirit of God to come. I know there's many churches, we want the gifts, we want manifestations, we want this to happen, we want to look really spiritual. But do we really want the Spirit of God to come in our midst in a way that will change us? Not mess us up, but change us for God's glory. If we want to be changed... If we want to become different, if we want to walk away from addiction, if we want to walk away from lust and sin, and we want to walk into being a new creation, and we really want the promises of God, and I don't want to be like I was growing up, and I don't want to be like the things that I saw when I was a kid, and I don't want to make the past mistakes, can I tell you that it's going to happen by the power of God? It's not going to happen because of good intentions. It's not going to happen because you know more than you used to. It's only going to happen By the power of God, not by works, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So I'm done. Music team, if you would come. It's very simple, it's very basic, and that's by design. Listen, there's so much information and so much misunderstanding sometimes. And the reality is it's, it's simple. We're all messed up and Jesus died for us. And he died for us not only to forgive us, which is awesome, and we have to have that. But in the new covenant, we now become children of God and co-heirs with Christ. And he restores us. This whole story, salvation, the good news, it's about restoration. We often talk in the church about revival. Revival's good. Revival's exciting. But revivals usually only last for a period of time. And when the oomph goes out of it, everybody flatlines. This thing is about restoration. It's about when people in their heart understand that I'm no longer a nobody, but I'm a son of God. I'm a son of God whether I'm preaching. I'm a son of God if I'm worshiping. I'm a son of God if I'm working in the nursery. I'm a son of God if I'm outside. I'm a son of God because I belong to him. This is not about what I can do. This is not about certain aspects. This is about restoring God's people. When people are lost, it's because we don't know who the Father is. We're cut off. We're separated. We may have heard about Jesus, but we're not restored to him. Think about... uh, God wants to restore us where we can walk as his children. We can walk in his authority. We can walk as a true witness in every aspect of our life. The way we handle the good, the way we handle the tough, the way we deal with situations, the way we raise our kids, the way we do business, everything. Would you seek him? Would you join us over the next month? We're just going to go slow. It's going to be simple. It's not going to be... What does God want to give us? What is your promise? This is the promise of the Father. Jesus says, wait on the promise of the Father. His DNA. You belonging to him. 
You don't have to be a loner anymore. You don't have to be stuck out there in left field. You don't have to be thinking, well, if I do enough good. No, you can belong. This is the promise. His presence, His Spirit living in you. Trinity, yet He draws us in. If it happens, if God moves in our midst, I promise you, this will be the best year for Bethel that we've ever had. This will be the best year for Sweetwater. This will be the best year for this community because it will empower us to love. And it will empower us to serve. And it will empower us to be a true witness that the world so desperately needs. We don't need more church services. We need Jesus. We need the Father. We need the Holy Spirit in our lives. What's the Lord saying to you? How do you need to prepare? Are you willing to seek? Maybe this is all Greek. Just know this. The Father loves you. He sent His Son to die. He poured out His Holy Spirit so that we could live. Bottom line. Do you have all three of those? Do you need it more fully? Would you begin preparing today? We're not gonna, I'm not going to pray for anybody to receive the Holy Spirit today. This is just about us. This is about it. personal. Would you begin preparing? Would you begin seeking? Would you ask God, God, show me. I'm serious. God, I need more of you. That you would become greater and I would become less. Would you begin seeking today? Pray with me. Father, I love you. I thank you for this day, God. I thank you that your promises are yes and amen. I thank you that you sent your son to die for us. But I thank you, God, that just like your word says, that you didn't leave us as orphans, but you gave us your Holy Spirit to walk and dwell with us, God. I see it in so many of us. I know that most all of us have some of this, God, but I pray that you would begin to come fuller in our lives, in my life, God, to guide us, to correct us, to rebuke us, to instruct us, to change us, to empower us, to do what only you can do God things that are going to blow our mind as time goes on but we'd look back and say man it happened when God got bigger in my life when his presence took over my life so I just ask today if you're here and you want to go on this journey or you're willing to begin preparing I would just ask you to come for a moment to an altar and say God I'm coming after you I'm coming after you we need your promise if you're here and you have particular needs, you have a special prayer or a certain situation going on, we'll be glad to pray for you. But other than that, as we close in worship, this is just about you seeking the Lord today and what he's saying to you. Father, we love you. We thank you. Have your way as we close. In